Well, good morning. Good to see everybody today. Do you have a Bible this morning? We're going to the 100th Psalm. 1 Psalm 100. And we're going to spend all of our time at Psalm 100 today. That will consume all of our time. Hope you have something to write with. Maybe jot a, margin, a note or two in the margin of your Bible. That will help you, I think, as we go through what we want to... Uh, what we want to consider today. Certainly good to see all of you along with the sentiment expressed by Mark a moment ago. We welcome you. Thank you for being with us. If you're visiting with our church family today, especially, we welcome you. Now, you know we've got a lot of folks because it's Thanksgiving weekend. We have folks spread from coast to coast uh, from our congregation. And uh, we know a lot of them are joining us via live stream today. And so we welcome you even though you're away from us today and other folks who join us via live stream as well. Happy to have you with us, whether in our auditorium or whether by live stream. It's also wonderful. We love the holidays, Thanksgiving and Christmas, because we, uh, we have a lot of our young people who grew up in our congregation and then have moved on, either by work or marriage or school, who come back for the holidays, and we get to renew our acquaintance with them. And that's always very special as well. And so great to have everybody back with us today. Hope you have your Bible at Psalm 100. We're going to read there in just a moment, and we're going to spend, again, all of our time right in that passage <clears throat> this morning. Hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I love Thanksgiving. We've talked about that before. I like Thanksgiving a great deal. We gather as families. We feast. We watch football. We enjoy good meals together. It's an it's a amazing holiday in, in many ways. Uh, Black Friday, from what I saw in the news, certainly looked a little bit different this year. Uh, Cyber Monday is on the horizon for tomorrow. Our college kids are gone, and that's different as well because they're not going to be back until the beginning of the spring semester. But for most everybody in this room, tomorrow is a day when you either go back to work or for our younger students, you go back to school. And before long, Thanksgiving is just kind of out of sight and out of mind. I used to think that Thanksgiving was the one holiday that was unmess upable. That's not really a word, but it should be. It was the one holiday I thought that you can't really, you just can't mess it up. But in kind of ways we have, I think. Thanksgiving has kind of become a speed bump between Halloween just to get us to Christmas. It's just there. We don't give it the attention that it used to get, but it's still a special day in many ways. I want to take you back to the future about a couple of things real quickly before we get really where we're going this morning. I want to remind you of two things that we talked about uh, earlier uh, in the last 12 months. The first is, you remember that last year in December, I went back to Trieste, Italy, where Gianni Berdini is, and I, I told you when I got back about the nativity scene in the, in the piazza in the square in Trieste. It's the most beautiful nativity scene you would, you would ever find anywhere. And I told you about the fact that, that baby Jesus is miss, missing out of the nativity scene, which is always interesting to me. And the first time I saw that, I asked Gianni, I said, Where, you know, where's Jesus? And he said, well, they get Jesus out on Christmas Eve, and he's there for Christmas and Christmas night. And then the day after Christmas, they put him back in the box until next Christmas Eve. And I, I've always thought that that's kind of an appropriate thing for what, what so many individuals do with Jesus. They get him out of the box when they need him, but then they put him back in when they're finished with him. And I think we do that with Thanksgiving a little bit. It's one day, we're really happy for it. We listen to the obligatory sermon the Sunday after Thanksgiving, but really then it's kind of out of sight and out of mind. But I really do believe that God meant for Thanksgiving to be something more than that. You understand that because of the the good students that you are of the Bible and because of the good Christians that you are. And so you know that Paul said, give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And so this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus, that in every circumstance you would learn to give thanks. Now let's be very honest, that's hard to do. And so this was element number two of going back to the future. And so last year on this Sunday, I talked about four, four things that is very difficult to be grateful for. Now, I know you've probably thought about those every day and you've kept them in your own memory and they're in the forefront of your mind. But just in case you might have slipped your mind, let me just refresh your memory. There are four things I think that it's very difficult sometimes to be grateful for. One is for things that are expected, things that we just naturally expect. If it's what we think a person ought to naturally do or what we pay them to do, then it's very, very difficult for us to be very grateful for that. And so if that's the obedience of a child or the sacrificial love of a parent or whether it's service in a restaurant or whether it's competence in a business, we just expect that. And so it's hard to be thankful for that. But if those things aren't there, 
We can immediately begin to point that out. We can complain about that. We can get bent out of shape pretty quickly about that. It's hard to be grateful for what is expected. I'm not sure what that is. We're going to hope that stops. All right. Secondly, it's, it's hard to be grateful for what is unexceptional. Unexceptional. And what I mean by that are little things that go unnoticed. There are little things in all of our lives that just go unnoticed. They don't change very much in the course of a day or a week or a month or a year. And so they're unexceptional. But they're things that, that kind of help us enjoy life a little bit more. You know, maybe that's simple things like, uh, for me, when I look out and see open Bibles when I preach, I mean, that's a kind of an unexceptional thing, but I appreciate that. I appreciate getting a handwritten, old-fashioned, in-the-mail note or a letter. I, I just kind of like that. It's unexceptional, but I really do like that. I, I appreciate Starbucks, and especially one that's going in just down the street from here on the corner of Bush and 56. I mean, I understand now what the psalmist meant when he said, Lord, you have heard my cry and answered my prayer. I'm good with that now. These are, un, these are unexceptional things, but they make life better. You know, it's a little bit of sugar with life. You can't live on sugar, but, but a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine of life go down. And if you're a young person, you don't want that reference is, your mom and dad didn't raise you right. Third, things that are invisible, hard to be grateful for those. You know, in Christianity, there are a lot of things that are invisible that, that are important to us. Forgiveness, grace, acceptance, prayers heard in heaven, love, salvation. Those things aren't, you can't put your finger on those. They're invisible, but they are no less real. And then four, things sometimes that are difficult. Now, that's a really hard one, isn't it? That's really challenging because anybody can thank God when things are going well. But can you be grateful to God when life just stinks in so many ways? You know, James would say that that's a mark of maturity when you can do that. That one of the marks of a really spiritual person is the one who is able to look at the difficulties and trials of life and understand that if they can navigate their way through that successfully, it's going to be a benefit to them in some meaningful, tangible kind of way. But it's hard to be thankful for what's unexpected or unexceptional or invisible or difficult. But let's go back to where we began a moment ago in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18. In every circumstance, give thanks because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So this is God's will. Let's think about that. If this is God's will, then if we don't do that, if we're not doing God's will, or if we do the opposite of God's will, what would the Bible describe that as? Well, I think the Bible would call that a sin, but we usually don't think about it that way. And if it's a sin, it's a minor league sin. It's certainly not a major league sin. It'd just be something minor in our life, but I'm not sure that God sees it that way. Because God, it seems to me, really does care about this business, this business of gratitude. Now this brings us to Psalm 100. A spirit of gratitude and thanksgiving is interwoven through Psalm 100. In fact, in your Bible, there are 150 Psalms. This is the only one of the 150 Psalms whose heading is a Psalm of Thanksgiving. Now, there's a lot of thanksgiving in the Psalms, but this is the only one that is specified as a psalm of thanksgiving. Do you have your Bible this morning? If you don't have a Bible, I'm going to put the verses on the screen because it's really important this morning that we read these words together. So here's Psalm 100. Now, it's a very simple psalm. It's just five verses, 79 words, and so it's quick and easy and simple, but they're important. Let's read them together. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people. We are the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. You know, that song has rightfully, because it is in fact a song, it has been sung as a hymn. It's been used as a launching pad for thousands of sermons. Again, it's just five verses and 79 words, and yet they're extremely important because these words are a reminder that Thanksgiving really isn't just a day. It is an action. That Thanksgiving is a verb. It's an action word. And so in this psalm, you have these words, shout and worship and come and know and enter and give thanks. All of these are saying, look, this is something that God wants you ultimately to do. 
The writer shows us that thanksgiving is expressed in a variety of different ways. And so he just begins in verse number one, and he says, you know what? If you want to, if you want to express gratitude to God, just do that. Say it. Now, the way he said it was, shout for joy. Shout for joy. Shout joyfully to the Lord. You know, when somebody has done something really good, something kind for us, we want to express appreciation. Well, how do you do that? <clears throat> how do you show appreciation to God? I mean, what are you going to get God as a thank you gift? Well, he owns everything. Haggai 2 and verse 8, all the silver is mine, all the gold is mine. Everything is his. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all that there is. So what are you going to give to God? What you can give of him, the psalmist says, is you can express your appreciation to him. You can express your appreciation. God notices that. You know how I know God notices that? Because there's a story in the book of Luke chapter 17. There's a story in the book of Luke chapter 17 where Jesus is walking along and there are 10 men and they are lepers. Now it was a terrible thing. They were outcasts from society because of that. And when they see Jesus, word has gotten to them that this man is a healer, that he can heal anything. And so in Luke 17, they, they say, help us, Jesus. And he does. And so he heals them. And then it's almost as if they say, um, never mind. Things are better now. Because only one of them came back and said, thank you. Now, maybe there were all kinds of mitigating circumstances there that we're not aware of. I, I don't know. But I do know that Jesus noticed the one who did come back and say thank you. And he did notice that the others did not. And so he expects there to be an expression of that. And in fact, in the next verse, he says worship. H how do you say thank you to God? Well, you, you can tell him. You can tell him thank you as well we should. But you can also do that through through worship, worship the Lord with gladness. In fact, Jesus put those things together, right? And so in Matthew 4 and verse 10, he said, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. The word worship and serve are cognates of each other. They have the same foundation, the same root. And so the way you worship is by serving and the way you serve is by worship. They go together. And so one of the ways that we express gratitude to God is we just... We, we worship him. We live in obedience to him. We live the example of his, of his son who went about doing good. And so you express that in service. You do something. The applications that I think are endless. I mean, if you're a college student, if you're a college student, your mom and dad are providing your education for you. It seems to me the way you say thank you to them is you get up, you go to class, you do your best. That's the way you say thank you to your mom and dad for providing you an education. If you're a young person and your mom and dad have helped you buy an automobile, how do you say thank you to them for that? Well, you take care of it. You take care of it. You do what you can to, to do what you can to, to, to show them that this is valuable to you. This means something to you. And if you're grateful to God for the salvation that he offered us in Jesus Christ, how do you say thankful for that? Thank you to that. Well, I, I think you, you do that by, by, by walking with his son. And then he said, you know what else you can do? It, is not just tell God how much you appreciate him. And, and not just worship and service, but, but you can do that with some emotion. And so he, he uses three words here, joy, gladness, and joyful songs. Now, the version of the Bible that I grew up with says singing. And so joy, gladness, and singing. And I think the point that the psalmist is making in that is that, that nobody's being coerced here. Nobody's being forced. Nobody's telling you, you know what, this is what you ought to do and you've got to do. They're not being told that this is what they have to do. This seems to be natural from them joy and gladness and singing side note here real quickly if i may this is one of the psalms that is the psalm of ascent and so they would go up to jerusalem to worship and the psalms of ascent are those songs that it is assumed were sung as they went up to jerusalem to worship now that makes sense in Psalm 100 because you have those phrases, come into his courts with thanksgiving, come before him. And so all of that indicates that this is exactly what they were doing. And so you know what that means, ladies and gentlemen? It means that these songs, like Psalm 100, 
was kind of their pre-worship routine. This was their, this was what they did as a precursor to the worship that they would offer in Jerusalem. And so this is what they did in many ways to prepare themselves to worship God. Have you ever given any thought to that? Have you ever thought about what is your pre-worship routine? Because we all do that. We're all creatures of habit. I guarantee you that what you do on Sunday morning is something that you did last Sunday and the Sunday before and probably going a long way back because we are all creatures of habit. And what I'm saying to you is, have you ever given that any thought? Because if everything in our pre-worship routine, before we get to this building, if everything outside of this building is secular, until we walk in the door, it's going to be really, really hard to flip a switch and suddenly have a spiritual mindset. There are a lot of things that you can do maybe to help your mindset. You know, at some point, probably the TV needs to go off and maybe the, maybe the music you're listening to needs to, needs to change. For me on Sunday morning, it's praise and harmony. I listen to the praise and harmony uh, singers. And that helps me. It helps get me ready to come into worship of God. But the point of it is that they thought about worship before they worshiped. Isn't that interesting? They were doing something to get themselves right with God before they actually got to Jerusalem. Well, so they're doing all of this. They're telling God and they're worshiping and serving God. And they're doing this with emotion and joy as they, as they go to Jerusalem. And then there's a, a reason why for this. I mean, if somebody were to ask, well, you know what? If the kids, for example, in the caravan, and that's certainly how they would travel to Jerusalem. So if the kids in the caravan should say, you know, why are we doing all this? Why are we, why are we concerned about all this? The psalmist gives an answer here. He says, well, first of all, because the Lord is God. That's why. One of the reasons for your gratitude, the Lord's God. King David wasn't God. Abraham wasn't God. You're not God. I'm not God. The Lord is God. And so his position demands devotion and the respect of our heart. It's an early statement of what Jesus would say a millennium later in Matthew 22 and 37, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And secondly, not only is the Lord God, but he made us. He created us. We're the product of his hands. What a blow to evolutionary thought, but really more than that. What a blow to the spirit of self-sufficiency. The selfish spirits that said, you know what? It's my life. I can do with, I can do with my life what I want. Well, not really. You remember Paul in 1 Corinthians 6 and beginning of verse 19 said, don't you know that you were bought at a price and therefore you are not your own? Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which belong to him. Well, that's what the psalmist is saying. And then third, he says, we are his people. We belong to him. We are the possession of God. That's an important thought, ladies and gentlemen. We are his possession. Sometimes we get that reversed. And it's easy to think somehow that God doesn't really own us. We own God. And so we kind of control God. I mean, if we go back to the illustration of Trieste a moment ago, isn't that that mindset that will get Jesus out of the box when we need him? But as soon as he gives us what we want, as soon as we're finished with him, we put him back in the box until we need him again. But it really doesn't work that way. We're his possession. We belong to him. But the really good news about that is that we're the sheep of his pasture. And so he is our shepherd. The most famous song in the Hebrew hymnal is Psalm number 23. So open your hymn books to number 23. You could hear a psalmist say. And it begins with these words. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack for nothing. Now, the translation I grew up with said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, which never made sense to me when I was a little boy, because if he is my shepherd, why wouldn't I want him? That's not what he's saying. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack for nothing. Jesus picked up on that in John 10 when he said, I am the good shepherd. And all of that implies care, protection, nurturing, and love. And so in verse 4, he segues out of that, and as they make their way to Jerusalem, listen to what he says. When you come before God to worship, he said it ought to be characterized by thanksgiving and praise and thanks. 
thanksgiving, praise, thanks, and praise his name. Probably more accurately, the last phrase would be bless his name, exalt his name, acknowledge that his name is different than man's. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I think that there are probably five great enemies of gratitude. I think there are probably five great enemies of gratitude. Comparisons, or when we have a sense of entitlement, or human pride, or when we are bitter, or when we are short-sighted and can't see beyond ourselves. Those five things will destroy gratitude. They'll destroy thankfulness in any human heart. But it's interesting in Psalm 100, you don't see any of that. There's none of that. Because in Psalm 100, it's about God, praising God, thanking God. Their mindset was, you know, God's before us. And so let's, let's thank him. In the 30th Psalm, the psalmist said, you, God, you turn my wailing into dancing. You remove my sackcloth and clothe me with joy that my heart may sing your praise and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will praise you forever, forever. And with that, he segues into the final verse of Psalm 100, and it's this. The Lord is good, the Lord is love, and the Lord is faithfulness. If you don't get anything else this morning, ladies and gentlemen, let's just leave with this. That the psalmist said, everything that I've just said about gratitude and praise and thankfulness to God is because the Lord is good and the Lord is love. And the Lord is faithfulness. Now, I want to take you back to the future just one more time. I want to go back to something we said this summer. Earlier this summer, we made two observations about Israel's relationship with God. But sometimes they're true about spiritual Israel's relationship with God as well. Now, here was the first of the two things that we said. Number one, we said that we can miss the evidence of God's goodness and love and faithfulness even though they're all around us. Israel did. So Israel in the last book of the Old Testament said to God, wherein have you loved us? What have you ever done that indicates to us that you loved us? What an arrogant thing to say to God. But if we're not careful, we too can miss the evidence of God's goodness and love and faithfulness, even though they're everywhere about us. And so we said this summer, you know, that, that already today, Already today, God has baptized you in the proof of his love. Already today. I mean, it's only 10 minutes till 10. And God already today has baptized you in the proof of his love. He gave you a body that was strong enough to get out of bed. He gave you a bed to get out of. He gave you clothes to put on. He gave you food to eat. He gave you a house to walk out of. He gave you an automobile to get in. He gave you a land to live in where you are free to come today and worship him. He gave you scripture to read. And I'll tell you more than that, ladies and gentlemen, he gave you hope for the future. But we can get so fixated on what is only before our eyes that we fail to see. Fail to see the evidence of his goodness and love and faithfulness. And secondly, we'll either be a reflection of his love or a reflection of our culture. It's going to be one of the two. Your life, my life, all of our lives, we have, a, we have a center, we have a focus, we have an intention. And our focus is either going to be a reflection of what's going on in our culture or it will be a reflection of our Father. You can't have it both ways. You can't have it both ways. A lot of people try. And so a lot of people come and they'll give a nod to God on Sunday, but that's about it. But in the words of the Hebrew writer, God says, look, I'm persuaded better things of you than that. Things that accompany salvation. So can I ask you this morning, what are you thankful for? I mean, we just, we just came through a week and we came through in particular a day of Thanksgiving. Could I, could I just ask you, what are you thankful for? Now for me, that's a, I gotta tell you, that's a pretty easy list. I mean, for me, that list begins, first of all, with a promise that I have quoted from this pulpit a thousand times, where John writes and he says, look, these things I've written to you who believe in my name or in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, the assurance of salvation. 
I've got to tell you, I've reached a point in my life that if I live, that's, that's gravy. It's wonderful. I love life. God gave us a great life to enjoy. But I, I've reached a point in my life that I can honestly say with the Apostle Paul, I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ because it would be, in Paul's words, very much far better. Why? Because I believe that verse. But it's not just that. I'm grateful that we have truth. I'm, I'm thankful for truth. Because you know what? I turn on the news every day and what I see is confusion. I see political and philosophical confusion and conflict. I see a world that is divided at the seams, particularly in American culture, where life is presented as questions with no answers. I've said many times that in America, our obsession with left and right have made us forget that there is an up and a down. But thankfully, God gives us an objective, eternal, incontestable, irrevocable standard to which we can anchor our lives. No wonder the psalmist said in Psalm 119 and 105, through your word, I gain understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. And for me, next on the list is you. It's you. I say with Paul in Philippians 1, beginning in verse 3, I thank my God upon my every memory of you. I thank God for you. I got to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I, I know of churches. I know of churches that are relentlessly assaulted by division and internal criticisms and worldly thinking. And I will tell you that the chain reaction that that begins and where that ultimately ends is just heartbreaking. Effectiveness is forfeited. A meaningful, solid, good work is abandoned. And I think ultimately when that's the case, God's blessings are withdrawn. But I'm thankful for the many churches that I'm aware of throughout the length and breadth of these United States that have stayed the course and remained faithful to God's word and they're alive and vital and flourishing and strong. And they're striving to reach their community. But I tell you, they love each other as well. Something to be said for that. And then for me, fourth, most obviously, it's my physical family, my friends, who make a difference for good in my life. And I love Proverbs 17, 17, that, that a friend loves at all times. And a true brother, a genuine brother, is born for times of adversity. And that's been true in my life. Hasn't that been true in your life as well? I thank God every day for the many people who, who color my life with a richness and a, and a goodness that makes my life better. Now that begins with my physical family, you know, with my wife and my kids and my grandkids. But it goes beyond that. It's people I work with every day. People like Carrie Keenan, who I will tell you is one of the finest human beings breathing God's air. One of the best people I've ever known in my life. I describe Carrie as an, as Jesus said once, he is an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. And Jonathan, you know, when we announced that we were going to look for a young preacher to come and share this work with me, we said we were going to take our time and do it right. And we did. We took 18 months. Now, we didn't have to take 18 months because I'll tell you, I'll tell you something I've never told you before. On the Sunday morning that I announced that, before I got back to my office, or when I got back to my office, I already had a text message or an email from young preachers wanting to know if they could come and talk to me about that. But we were careful in our search. And don't you think that we found by God's God's help and God's providence, the right person. I'm grateful for friends in my life. Friends I've been able to lean on. And, and I pray in some way you've been able to lean on me. Because all of this, ladies and gentlemen, the assurance of our salvation, the truth that God has given us, our church family, and our physical family, and our friends, they are gifts directly from the hand of God. And I'll tell you what else I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for second chances and new beginnings.
aren't you? For the times when we fail and God allows us to stand up again and start over. Now maybe that's you this morning. Aren't you grateful that if you came in this building today and you've never been baptized into Christ, but you've been thinking to yourself, you know what? I think today is the day. Then make it the day. Because God will let you do that. Aren't you grateful that God says, you know what? I'll give you a new beginning. I'll let you, listen to this. You can, you can have newness of life. Where else do you get that in this world? Or if you're a Christian and he gave you newness of life and you've gone back to an old way of living. I mean, who else is going to let you start over fresh and new all over again? God will. And if that's you today, ladies and gentlemen, that's you today. And there's a response you need to make to God in a public way. And we can help you. We hope you'll let us. Let's stand. Let's sing.